good afternoon everyone i hope you all had a good lunch let's now move on to the most exciting part of the afternoon the first live surgery uh, surgery for it's a medial meniscus allograft transplantation may i invite our moderators sachin tapasvi sujit jos and uh, dinsha pardiwala to take the stage uh, our faculty for this session is dr pablo gelber and anshu shekhar anshu over to you in the theater good afternoon everyone welcome to the war for the fourth live surgery uh, so our patient is a 25 year old male pharma by occupation he is a hypertension medications uh, with a bmi of 41.2 on a higher side he had uh, and surgery of right knee anatomical acl reconstruction with near total medial meniscectomy with lateral meniscal repair in march 2020 is complaining of right knee pain since last 8 to 9 months which is progressive and it increases on squatting and long walks so these are his images from the previous surgery he had irreparable peripheral longitudinal medial meniscus tear for which it required a near total medial meniscectomy these are the images post meniscectomy with only peripheral rim of the meniscus is seen with the capsule here peripheral lateral third meniscus tear was also there which was repaired with an all inside technique with the images seen here he also had an acl tear for which an anatomical acl reconstruction was done these are his clinical images he has a bit of hyperextension he has full knee range of motion there is no anterior tibial step off has a stable anterior drawer and stable in medial lateral so dial is also negative on both sides this is his gait which is suggestive of a normal gait these are his x-ray images or recent x-ray images which we are here we can see an acl reconstruction which has been fixed with an endo button and a titanium interference screw these are his scanograms here we can see he has a, a normal limb alignment these are his uh, sagittal mr images suggesty of near absence of medial meniscus with an intact acl graft and a normal lateral meniscus the axial images also suggest the same here we can see in the first image the oblique sagittal view showing an intact acl graft the coronal ones and here we can see a small signal at the lateral meniscus repair area in the posterior horn these are his ct images showing the tunnel positions the 3d ct image of femoral tibia uh, femoral acl position the tibial acl position on a 3d ct so the issues the patient has he has a near total medial meniscectomy status and healed acl and a neutral alignment so the plan here is right knee medial meniscus allograft transplantation by dr Paul pablo gelba over to you for the hello planning. everyone this is a case of uh, medial meniscus deficiency uh, in a normal aligned knee so we will address uh, a medial meniscal transplantation here um, we will perform a, an only soft tissue technique in this way a uh, mismatching of the allograft with the patient is not a big issue. Uh, we will start uh, performing um, three portals, one anterolateral, high anterolateral for a good uh, uh, visualization, and then two medial. One uh, more medial than the other one, right here, and the other one will be a large uh, parapatellar medial portal, as large as it will fit my fingertip within inside through the through the through the through the portal so our first step will be to clean up the remaining meniscal tissue and then we will perform the posterior root uh, um, tunnel which has to be really posterior and around the corner try never to do this or never to do to go to anterior which is the tendency and also because the obliquity of the of the of the tunnel uh, sometimes you, you, you believe you are here and you finally perform this tunnel and this will cause that the uh, medial root 
the, the posterior root will be inserted um, place two anteriorly. So you have to be really posterior here. And I always like to put some degree of uh, meniscal tissue inside within the, the tunnel. Once we have this, also we will perform two uh, spinal needles to help introduce the, the allograph. We will the, then we will introduce the allograph through the large uh, medial portal. And one, once it is inside, uh, we will stitch it in the posterior horn. And finally, we will calculate where the anterior horn tunnel has to be done, because in some cases, uh, we consume uh, with, with this putting the stitches against the, the capsule can make that the graph uh, cannot fit or cannot reach the anatomic position. So first this and the last step will be the anterior horn tunnel to finally fix the, the allograph. Okay, over to the OR. Okay, Pablo, okay. hello there. And uh, along with me, we have uh, Sujit and Binshaw, so you're live. And we're all excited to see your technique for performing a medial meniscus transplant. Hello, thank you, Sachin. You will have a, a meniscal transplantation done here in medial side. Um, I will try to do the best because I'm not used to operate without playing reggaeton, but uh, I think I can make it. So first of all, as we were saying before, I will do the pie crusting of the MCL, though I have enough room. This is a big uh, knee. Uh, Dr. Pablo, Dr. Sujit here. Uh, most of us have very little experience on uh, meniscus allograft transplant, uh, except maybe the people sitting on beside me. Uh, so when you order an allograft, uh, uh, how do you decide the size? Uh, uh, to be honest, I don't, re I don't trust much the tissue bank guys, so I always request something much bigger, at least 10 to 20 percent bigger than I really, I am really measuring the patient. Uh, so, do, do they come in different sizes? Like so uh, I, I only, I only, uh, I only ask for the anthropometric measure. I mean, the, the, the height of the patient. Mm -hmm. If the patient is right, let's say 170, mm -hmm. uh, I request for an allograft coming from uh, the same gender, around 178 and 180 centimeters. So and I would. And is that because you can adjust by exactly. making sure that, that horns go into the bone? Exactly. That's the advantage of uh, only soft tissue. Uh, the problem with the bone, uh, uh, bone plug technique is uh, you, you have to be really accurate. You have to rely a lot on the bone tissue. And even though in some cases, because of the suture, because of the uh, lax capsule, you, you finally put uh, a little bit very a little bit extruded the meniscus and, and the, the anterior horn will not fit, will not reach the anatomic position. That's why I always request a bigger one. So in that case, if it, it is still big, I put some of the meniscal tissue inside within, within the, the anterior tunnel. And the anterior tunnel, I will do it at, uh, as I commented on before. At the, at the end, I need a, a, just a set. I, need a, I will perform two medial portals, one for the introduction, a big one, right parapatellar. Right here. Okay, can you take it out? Thank you. This so, one. Pablo, any specific uh, different orientation of the portals when you're doing a medial meniscus transplant, or would they just be the same that you follow? Can, can, you, can you say it again, Sachin, please? Yeah, I mean, the portal placement, yeah, that you're showing right now. Are you, are you taking the portals uh, slightly lower than usual, yes. or at the same? Yes, absolutely, a little bit lower. Uh, because also we have it for out-in sutures through this portal. And uh, because I had to do it much larger, okay? So in that way, I start lower, but then I go up as, as, uh, let's see if I can get, okay, you see my tip there? Yes. Okay, so I open it up a little bit. And another tip I recommend to do, probably not here because it's a revision case, so, the soft tissue is already uh, kind of fibrotic, but in most in primary, primary cases, I recommend also to seal the edges of the portal with the radio frequency to decrease the risk of problem with the, with the sutures. I open it generously, so this will prevent any potential headache later on. As you are seeing here, 
I think it is big enough. Now we go with the relative frequency, as I commented on before. Uh, yes, I will. Okay, you see here. Wait. This is two minutes time investing. So they will be, then later will be much easier. So now I will uh, resect uh, this uh, rim of a, uh, 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 yes, uh, yeah, big one. Not much because I like to have some remnant, but something to have it more straight. Not this kind of thin lip. So what sort of rim do you want to leave behind? Do you what want dream? to go right till the capsule or you'd rather leave a small couple of millimeters well, behind so that your sutures can hold well? Yeah, exactly. That's what I was trying to, to, to say. If I can, if there is some remnant, I try to leave something, this peripheral rim. I don't believe that this much. Uh, this is the problem here. If I leave this, this is loose, you see. And probably I will repair the meniscal transplant, the, the graft here, and they will give me a false feeling of uh, fixation. So I go as much as I see an stable uh, rim. Okay, that's it. We switch portals. We keep doing this in the medial, in the in the body, and I will try the anterior horn. And why do you leave a rim behind? Is it to aid in healing or to identify the anatomical location? Pardon me? Uh, why do you leave the rim behind? Uh, does it aid in I healing? I mean, the, the rim has a role. I mean, it's the most important, biomechanically, it's the most important <laughs> aspect of the, of the meniscus. If I leave the rim, mm -hmm. I may prevent some degrees of extrusion. The problem is when you have no rim at all and the, the capsule is abused and redundant, that uh, in some cases you have to perform a capsulodesis. We do mm -hmm. it a lot. In the lateral aspect, because the capsule, the lateral capsule is much more loose. Okay. Can I have the yes? But in the medial, in the medial side, it's very rarely. I, I did, I have, I done it sometimes in, um, in root repairs. Mm -hmm. To reduce the extrusion, because I'm not really extraordinarily happy with the uh, root repair uh, MRI aspect. Hard to de decrease and reduce the meniscal extrusion. So in those cases, sometimes I perform capsulodesis. Okay. I think we are quite well here. This part is harder, the remnant of the anterior horn. We will go more aggressively with the radio frequency, RF. Now, Pablo, this gentleman has very good articular cartilage. Yes, what yeah, would surprisingly. Be, yes, so what would be your limit to saying, mm. look, this chondral wear uh, contraindicates a meniscus transplant? Uh, it's a big. Uh, I mean, there, there is no a straight line between that, the red line. It depends on the age. It depends on, of course, I mean, the cartilage. I try to do it always in healthy cartilage because although you can do it in when they said grade three or four, the failure rate is really high. It's already high when you have a nice uh, cartilage, so it's much higher when do, you, you have a, a rough uh, cartilage which can easily harm the, the graft. So I try to be very, I used to be more aggressive with indication, now I am more conservative and uh, in those cases that the cartilage shows uh, some degrees of uh, uh, advanced degrees of injury, I try to avoid doing meniscal transplantations alone. Probably there is a room for presotocondyl allograft with uh, the meniscus. Okay, we go here to resect as much as I can of the posterior horn because the tunnel, as I said before in the, in the, in the drawing, never has to be done here because, because of, the, of the obliquity also, it will open up here. So we have to go really, really, really deep. It's probably the most, not challenging, but the more crucial aspect of the medial meniscal transplantation. Okay, I think that's a good point. Yeah. We will fi finally have the, the tunnel here. Uh, Pablo, another question. So I think when we're putting in uh, several stitches, I believe a couple of them will be inside-out sutures. So 
would you normally prefer to make a safety incision uh, before you start your meniscus repair or would you do it only if the need would be and again would you take a, uh, would you not take a safety incision when you're doing a medial or a lateral transplant or you know you're selective about the same you mean if i perform a posterior lateral or posterior medial mini incision to check for the implants yes for, for the sutures yes no, no i never i never do that no I don't believe it's needed. And I, I, I'm not very you know, aggressive with the number of stitches. I'm very conservative. Some people perform a lot of stitches. You will see that probably I will use three, no more than four implants, plus both horns, plus the, the one a stitch which is out in here, one out in here. That's more than enough. OK, I think. And the, the type of allograft, Pablo, what's the type of allograft that you use back home and what type of allograft are you using here? Uh, the same thing. Well, uh, this, is, this came with the bone, uh, with the, uh, but uh, I, I, as, I, as you saw before, I just took it out from the media plateau. So the same, I just I use the fresh frozen. Fresh frozen? Okay. Yeah. I think this is fresh frozen too, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the one we have is the one from MTF, uh, the shot, the one that we be you know, used to using in India, which is a fresh frozen, uh, which comes with a tibial hemiplatu. Okay, I will go for the same incision he had because of the ACL. There is quite a lot uh, soft tissue here, so I'm trying to be, make it a little bit bigger. Can you hold the, the scope, pick up for me? So uh, can you, can Dr. You bring, Pablo, yeah, can, you bring, just can you bring the back, graph? Uh, we are just playing back the graph that you had. Oh, okay, okay, I see, I see, perfect. You, you see could it. see it on the TV. Yes, yes, I will describe it. So you can see here, it comes with the middle plateau. I prefer it this way because I, I prepare it. Otherwise, usually, you know, the, the guys from the tissue band, they are not as, not accurate, but uh, they don't do it as much as, I, as accurately as I, as I like to have it, which is having a lot of, um, um, uh, uh, the whole horns, the whole anterior and posterior horn, even detaching some part of the many of the of the ligaments and uh, the periosteum, because in that way I can introduce, I can put this soft tissue within the tunnel. That for me is very important. That's the reason, from my point of view, why the the root repairs fails the most. I mean, because of they don't have any tissue within the tunnel. We are relying in a meniscus over the tibia. So you see here, I trying to detach, to resect. The posterior horn is harder because it's smaller, the insertion. As you are observing here. So you're basically taking it with the sh white shiny fibers. Exactly, exactly. I, I like to keep that and to perform the whip stitches right in that part. Otherwise, it would be similarly to the root repair, which is nothing within the tunnel. It would be uh, on lay. Um, only uh, fixation. In the anterior part, is, in the anterior horn, is easier because they are, in this case, didn't come with the intermeniscal ligament, but still you have a lot of uh, insertion that goes to the tibia, as you're observing there. You can speed up the, the video if you want. Yeah. Okay. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's okay. So you're, oh. so finishing there. Pablo, uh, yeah. have you ever had a n aseptic immune rejection to this graft? Have you ever seen something like that? I mean, uh, you, you cannot have an immune rejection with something which is uh, fresh, fresh frozen. The problem is there is some degree of shrinkage that probably uh, it, there is some subtle immune rejection, but it hasn't been really uh, reported any immune rejection with fresh frozen or e even cryopreserved allograft. Uh, so the problem is the, the degree of uh, shrinkage you, you get. But uh, I wouldn't say like an immune rejection. That's not a, not a real issue when you use fresh frozen allograft. There is no living cells. You're seeing see there the whip stitching, similarly to what we do to any, any tendon, semitendinosus or ACL or whatever. Another question, Pablo, is that normally, you know, you need to thaw that graft 
before we start using it. Do you use simple normal saline or do you use it uh, with vancomycin? I always use it with the vancomycin. Yes, I, in a, it's one gram of vancomycin in one in 100 uh, milliliter of uh, saline. Normal saline. Yeah. Any different suture that you use for the anterior and the posterior horn? Are you going to be using yeah, simple I, I, number two, or are you going to be using some form of a tape or something of that sort? No, I I, I use number two, uh, high strength suture. In this case, it's high five from Comet. I had to change the, the suture because I, I, got, I got a knot. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, when you open the box with two different sutures, they comes one with uh, white and the other is uh, striped. striped. Yeah. So uh, that helps you to recognize which one is outside. Otherwise, I mean, it's not a big issue. It's not like a rotator cuff repair. You only have two, three sutures here. It's not a big deal. I mean, if you have Perfect. only the same color, it's fine well, anyway. Perfect. So can you hold this? So you're only uh, seeing the, the graph. You are yeah. showing, you're also watching my uh, um, the scoping or not? I'm sorry for the A, but the, the heart. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank with you. Thank you, Pablo. With, with all my love. Thank you so much. Do you ever use a bone plug, Pablo? Do you ever use that? I used to. Uh, first, I started with bone plugs in the anterior and posterior horn. Then I switched to the bone plug only in the posterior horn, and now only, only soft tissue. In revision cases, in the lateral side, I use bone bridge. So you use not, not using anymore, yeah. So on the lateral side, you'd use the entire uh, bone wedge so that the anterior and the posterior horn are connected with that bone ridge, right? Is that right? Uh, can you say it again? I was uh, focusing on something else. <laughs> say it again. Sorry. On the lateral side, do you use the bone wedge or? No, only no. in revision cases. I only soft tissue and always anterolateral tenodesis. Uh, capsulodesis, uh, pardon, caps, <laughs> anterolateral tenodesis. I was talking about that. No, the cap lateral capsulodesis. We have published several studies on that in arthroscopy and Kesta. Anatomic, biomechanical, and clinical studies showing that it decreases the extrusion. failure rate and also the extrusion even more comparing to bone bridge. Thank you. Are you seeing the... Uh, the arthroscopy uh, image. We've got the arthroscopy image and the outside image now. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit... Yeah, you see here, it's a little bit medial. Can you see the scope? Yeah. Uh, it's not a big issue, but still I prefer a little bit more lateral. Can you hold the, the, the scope? Thank you. So, we will change the entry point, otherwise they will go to the same place. Okay. Uh, the degree of the, uh, of the guide right now is the slower, the slowest one. It's around 35 or 40. Probably there is the screw here. <laughs> I think this is the screw we changed. Yeah. Hey! I was going to say how accurate this guy is, but we will change everything. When this happened, you had to change the setup. We go again. Uh, okay, can you hold the camera? Uh, the, no, let's see. Okay, third try. Let's see. Finger cross. This is probably the most important aspect of the medial. Uh, I think probably is hitting against the the screw, and the deviating the. I like it here. Yeah. I like it here. I, I'm sure there is something with the, with the screw. Yeah. Because I'm right there. So that was one of the questions I was going to ask you. Since uh, I had put in a titanium screw, do you want to take it off 
before you start your uh, uh, yeah uh, yeah I forgot that issue okay thank you for saying that once the, this is done no, I'm just kidding uh, well I would try I mean now if if yeah. I can go through through it I will I will keep it otherwise I will have to take it out hopefully I will not this is a uh, how how big is this yeah this is I need a five this is a, a smaller than that right I will go with a five millimeter drill and in the anterior aspect probably five or even six sometimes is I need to put some meniscal tissue within the tunnel that was for another company right yeah. so I think this is another important point is that uh, when you're trying to pull inside meniscus tissue then sure you would also okay. use a larger size tunnel than what you would normally do when you're doing a root repair so if you're doing a root repair you probably do a four five or a five oh but uh, when you're trying to pull meniscus inside a bone tunnel, then you probably use a 5.5 five or a 6. 6. Yeah. Yeah, for rule repair, at the end, it depends on the technique of you choose. You can be with a full tunnel, uh, a full tibial tunnel. It can be done with a retro reamer. It can be done with uh, some company have uh, with uh, small kai okay, so wires. We have to change it? Oh. They are playing against me. They are my enemies. They gave me a, a different, uh, no problem. This happened in the best families. We had to change. It was too thick. Yeah. That was probably for the interferences. OK, let's see. So for, uh, we had to go again to switch. Uh -huh. Okay, I like it there. That's fine. Okay, fourth try. It was the wrong. Can you show me there? Uh, upper, upper there. I can't see anything. I don't know why. I will switch. <coughs> uh, no, I don't like it. You see, it's too anterior. The same, the, the thing I said before. Let, give me just, uh, uh, give me only the. I, I will do it hand, hand free. Can you say this? This is not the one we have to use. There is another one. This is too long. It's okay now. I like it better, right? Yes, definitely. Much better now. So yeah. give me the. It's not difficult to do it hand free when there is only one, a couple of millimeters of difference. No, no. This is, this is not. This, what, what size is this? What size is this? This is a five? Yes. Yeah. From Comet? Button. Yeah, but why it doesn't fit? It should. What is this? Yeah, but it's too short. Oh, okay. Let's see. This is a five. Yeah. But probably this is from not from Comet or what? Okay. Okay, there we go. I will need a, a, a small spoon. Okay, I will keep this here. Do we have a spoon? I will reset the, this. Uh, no, 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 a small, just a curet. Exactly. Oh, perfect. We 
There we go. So you're just trying to okay. increase the surface area now for uh, and expose some cartilage? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, do we have this one, this here? Uh, is this so? OK. I take it out, but I need the, uh, do we have a suture passer? Yes. Otherwise, yeah, uh, no, give me the, the same, the same, you want to the yes. I reset this of tissue. I mean, to be honest, the procedure is almost done. Because this is the more, probably the most, not challenging, but delicate step of the procedure to be really in the place you want to be. Uh, do we have a. Yeah. You go? It's still not here. Okay. There you are, baby. Okay, I love it. Uh, we take this out now. Yeah, we need a. Oh, this one, it's fine, yes. Um, another one for you, yeah. Good, excellent. Now, with two spinal needles, I will go posterior medial. I will introduce water there. Are these standard 18 gauge or 16 gauge spinal needles? This is 18. 18. In the old uh, uh, graph with bone plug, um, uh, w was it uh, difficult to pass the bone plug and what size used to be used? And why did you change to a uh, method without a bone plug? Was it because it's easier or the results are the same? Uh, to be honest, the, the main reason, can I take the, out, the light out? Because I, I, I can't see the transillumination. Yes, I don't see the transillumination. OT lights off? The, the, yeah. the, 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 the original and real reason was that the tissue bank stopped providing a uh, bony, bony graft. And then we started with some studies. I'm not, I'm not being uh, skill enough. Uh, this is too anterior. This is too high. Uh, still too anterior. I like it better. One up. I need, I need you to make a, a stab incision with a number, yes, 11, and the other um, spinal needle. So I think this is a good trick which uh, Pablo is showing us. If you can't, if you want to pass in needles from outside in, then you should switch off the lights in your operating oh, theater. No, no, Look no, at no. the transillumination that he's looking is, at right now, and that yeah. takes you exactly to where you should be putting your needles. So uh, that's they, a they very good trick uh, okay. that you okay. should try and use in your clinical practice. Okay, now we need a, this is a, this, this, the lower one. We introduce uh, the number one nylon or prolen or whatever. Can you hold this? Yeah, any of them. Do we have it? Just yeah. one, in. Uh, one is enough. Can you cut here? Right here with a with a scissor. Yeah. 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 Do you go for it? Yeah. Can I can I have a uh, grasper? I will put. Okay, he's introducing. Uh, this here. Can you hold this? Thank you. I want to grasp both at the same time, so introduce the second one. Yeah. No much needle inside. And remember, once I have it, catch them. I, you take the spinal needle first, and then I pull. Otherwise, this, uh, the sharpness of the tip can, can break the, okay. Excellent. Two colors. You can take 
both uh, spine and needles out, no problem, without hesitation. Both of them, yeah, okay. And now I pull, and I have this here. Okay, so now I will request our beautifully prepared uh, allograph with a Sachin name with heart on it. I mean, you can, of course, you, ha you have to draw. You have to draw something on the um, upper surface in order to be. You know, sometimes you, ca you can be struggling when the graph is inside. You don't know which is the anterior part, the posterior part. Sometimes it can be up. Uh, upside down. So um, you see here the okay. First, probably we will go with the posterior root, posterior horn, here, which is close to me. Yes, this is for me. Can I hold this, please, my friend? Thank you. So the posterior part, close to me. Otherwise, I don't have enough. Hold it. Yeah. Why it's not coming? Ah, you are in the middle. Okay, we are around the scope. <laughs> okay, so we're here. Can you hold it? Uh, this is done. Now, the uh, this is the lower one, the blue. We had to identify. It. Do it in that way, otherwise. So yes, these yes, are two sutures please. that you've taken at the junction of the posterior third and the mid exactly. third. Exactly. And these are going to be railroaded through your this portal. Lower, yeah. And you will use them as a reduction suture to yes, set your graft at the exact position. Yeah, it's, it is not mandatory, to be honest, but it helps you to uh, introduce the graft. And also, it's a very a strong fixation. Yes. So both for both reasons, we do it. But uh, it's not really, really strictly mandatory. Some people don't do it. I think this is really useful because getting the graft at the correct cranial yes. caudal level is critical. And this ensures that it sits in that exact cranial exactly. caudal level. OK, I, oh, wait. Uh, I'm doing through the loop. OK. OK, we pull there. We have both inside. Pull? No, no, wait, wait. Uh, OK, now we have to pull uh, first with the root. Just pull a little bit. I will need a uh, proof. I think it's upside down. No, Sachin is there. Sachin is on top. Sachin <laughs> is on, on the top of the top. OK, you see how I can introduce part yeah. of the soft tissue inside? That made me very happy. And this is really a strong fixation with the, th this point, OK, right? Then, so now I will, I, we will put some all inside suture here. Yeah. Uh, wait. Uh, and, and. I don't know why it opened a little bit more lateral than, more middle than, than we were before. Probably it communicate with the, with the previous, uh, Tunnels, but it's okay. This is what it is. Okay. Uh, now I need a mosquito here, so I apply a little bit tension on the on this uh, on the posterior horn suture. Can I have some, uh, you know, for the lead? We will go with a 80 millimeter length. Any meniscal repair can be used. I use this from, this is from the striker, the air one, simple to use. Can you hold the posterior root uh, suture? Because, OK. So I think that's another important trick that he's demonstrating is that you apply tension on the root, don't fix yes. it. And uh, before you fix the root, you go ahead and start fixing the meniscus to the capsule. So that's another very good important trick that can help adjust the tension, tension in the back tunnel more. that you've made. Open more. Yeah, that's very important. I like to, I mean, they are under tension, but still I prefer to do it at the, the last moment, because those, the, the, the roots are the more important fixation points, so I prefer to do it at the, at the end. 
Oh, it breaks. It broke. Another one. The next Probably I push the meniscus too close to each other. I will do it more generously now. So typically, Pablo, I mean, uh, what distance, what is the minimum distance between two meniscus sutures? We still don't have a logical answer for that, but in your clinical practice, uh, two sutures should be placed apart by how many millimeters? Uh, I agree with the first observation. There is no logical or biomechanical. I mean, I am not very aggressive with the number of sutures, so probably 10 millimeters. But again, this is a random answer. <laughs> Let's see now if I am more skillful. Open more than that. Okay, this works better. Another one. I'm not extremely happy with that one. That's why I'm going to put another one in the posterior horn. A question about the posterior tunnel. Uh, do you always drill from the medial uh, tibial plateau, or is there a point in doing it from the lateral side? Because you'll get a pull in that direction, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yes, fully agree. Some cases I do it from the contralateral side. In this case, I we were already with the ACL. I had already the incision. Yeah, from a biomechanical point of view, it makes sense probably to go from the contralateral, from the other compartment. OK. I think we are almost done with the all inside repair. Probably one more in the mid body. But we do it later after we, OK. OK, I'm happy with this. Good. This is here. It's a little bit high. OK, now uh, I will do this. Can you hold it? I need the uh, grasper, for example. I want to see the size of the, of the graph. Uh, wait. Right. I think it's quite big. It will be here. I think we can do it anatomically. In fact, it's kind of big one. So I, per I will perform a six millimeter anterior horn tunnel because the, the graph is really big, as you can see here. Yeah. Can you hold this? Uh, I also would like to have an, uh, mm, a spinal needle and the proof. Proof? So I will put it a little bit lower here. Dr. Sachin, you're not helping. Sachin, down there. Yeah, okay. please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it hurts. <laughs> Save me. I think the SNA is gone. There's only my chin left now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to put it back, put it down. Uh, no, it's okay. We will go for that because the anterior horn is pulling up a lot, so I will perform the second tunnel. Uh, do we have the, the tibial guide? In this case, the angulation is much higher. So I have one question. Yes. Only uh, one? <laughs> my name is Prashant. And can we know the graph size beforehand so that we are aware whether it will be larger or smaller? Uh, I mean, as I said before, it, everything depends on the surgery. It depends at the end when you do exactly place the posterior horn, uh, how redundant is the capsule. So it's very difficult to predict before you get it inside. That's why I switched many years ago from doing both tunnels initially to what I'm doing now. Because it's very difficult to predict. Even if you have a perfect graph, exactly the same uh, measure than the patient, it depends on many different variables. So it's hard to say. Yeah, okay. so typically, Prashant, uh, so whenever you order a graft, you'll need to give the patient's height and the weight. 
exactly. and you need to send them a calibrated AP and a lateral X-ray of their knee joint, I, which I, is a true I, AP and a true lateral. I don't do the polar technique with the X-ray because, again, I mean, it's, you're relying in the in something which is indirect measurement, and it changes so much during the surgery itself. How much uh, suture you place? Where do you place the tunnel? That at the end, from my point of view, is it's something that you need to be more accurate than the real procedure is. Can you hold this? I think the challenge for us here in India is getting the right size graph. So yeah. normally we get a CT scan done, and with the CT scan we know our measurements really well. Now we're dependent on what graft comes. If the graft sizing is perfect, then typically you'd like to use bone, I like to use bone plugs there because I think that that helps in the healing. But if the size is not perfect, then you can't use bone plugs. So then you use exactly this. So this is really okay. a very versatile technique. So I'm even if you've got a larger graft, you can adapt it to your patient. So I think that's the advantage of not using bone plugs. And very often you won't get the exact size. So you make sure that it's the right knee with the right meniscus. Preferably, gender should be the same, and the sizing should be approximately the same, if not a little larger, but not a little smaller. Exactly. And Try if you're to going to be using soft tissue fixation, like what Pablo is doing, make sure you order a slightly oversized graft, because you want to get some meniscus tissue inside the tunnel, which is just demonstrated. Can we use tenodesis anchors for fixation of uh, posterior anterior horns? Biceps stenodesis anchors, which we use, similar kind of fixation? Um, your access would be a little yeah. difficult at the horn areas, uh, but you could actually, I think a pullout is ideal, because a pullout you can adjust, and typically if you've got your posterior two tunnels, and you've got two reduction sutures, so typically I put one posterolaterally and one anteromedially. So with those two reduction sutures, the meniscus just goes and sits in position. Once it sits in position, it's like repairing a bucket handle tear of the meniscus. Yes, that's right. But I found that uh, at root, post, uh, usually on posterior root, if we don't have a proper tunnel, uh, like we saw in this case, there were two, three uh, attempts, and finally the tunnel is not very good. So once what I did, uh, while doing a repair, I used knotless anchor. I had my camera in posterior lateral corner, posterior lateral portal, and from medial portal, superior to uh, this thing, I used anchor and I fixed my root on that anchor. So something like that, is it possible using tenodesis screw? You it can use possible. Whatever. I mean, you can use knotless fixation. I mean, you the, the if you're going into the tunnel, what happen? I think it's all about access. I mean, if you can get that line of attack, you can do that, but. Traditionally, I think uh, what we've looked at is that pull-out switches have the best strength and um, for a, even for a root repair, I would always prefer now a pull-out suture rather than use a suture anchor uh, in the back. So um, uh, Pablo, as we can see now that uh, you've fixed the posterior third, you've uh, got the root in place and now your next is doing the anterior root. So while we were discussing, what was the angle of inclination that you used on this tunnel to drill the anterior root? The, uh, is the, I mean, at the end, it's not that important because at the end, you know the entry point and the exit point. In the posterior route, really, you really need to go the shallower, so around 40. And in the anterior route, in the anterior tunnel, uh, you have to be larger than that. But at the end, you want to have approximately one centimeter bridge between both tunnels in the tibia. So it's not important how much. I never see how many degrees you have. Okay. I just uh, not change it accordingly to, what I, to, to my needs. So I, I, I think it's pretty much anatomic. Uh, now we will go with some, uh, we can go with some all, all inside too. Another one, yeah. another error. You, say, you, you see, as I said before, I mean, I was really, a little, a little worried about the, that it was too uh, high above the meniscal rim, but now once the anterior horn is in place, which is partially inside the tunnel, as you see here, because I did a six, six millimeter tunnel, is absolutely, uh, in place. We will switch. I will go. I'm doing. I'm using only one portal in the middle side. I usually perform two. I don't know. I forgot to do it, but it's fine. You can still, uh, with the scope, you can put back a little bit there. Okay. We go here. I'm pulling back the graph with the scope. Okay. Perfect. 
This is, uh, uh, now I will put it in, let's say, 16 millimeter. He's doing all his, so he doesn't take this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, wait. Uh, right, you can take it out, the lid. Excellent. Uh, so a little bit, the angulation is not the nicest one. You can bend it a little bit, I forgot it. Probably I will, break, I will place another one. Can you, can you pull from the posterior uh, insertion? No, 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 the one, the, the posterior, exactly, yes. There we are. We will put another one. We will bend it slightly. Good. Oops. There we are. Again, with the scope, I try to put. Uh, uh -huh. Oh, it's a little bit uh, above. Uh, uh, I don't like it. You see, uh, it is too proximal. I don't like it much. Let me see when I put it back into, no, uh, I don't like it. I will take it out. Um, do we have a cocker? Can you hold this? No, the, the, the scope. You see what I did? So the allograft almost always tends to go more and more cranially. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, one, one trick that I use is I yeah, try and joystick it. So when I put yeah, yeah. the uh, suture in, I then push it downwards and then uh, take it there. I think that somehow helps me at least. Yeah, I, I usually use a, a spinal needle to do it. I tried to do it before. I, this is not, uh, do, we, do we have something that is not cutting? Yeah, some, some cut here. Not cutting it anyway. <laughs> no, they are not working. Yes, someone? Okay. Oh, probably a scissor. It's fixing it. <laughs> In fact, it doesn't cut it. Okay. It's not cutting it. I need something to cut this because otherwise this is more aggressive. We can also go from here too. Let's, ch let's change the tactic and play around. Wait, no, this is, no, no, it's okay. This is a nice arthroscopic uh, exercise. we are. It's been released now. Okay, we'll start again. Oh, this is, we will take it out later. Can you hold the, the camera? I need a proof and uh, yeah, uh, we'll go here. I need this. Can you hold the camera? Now the spinal needle. Go 
call Vijay and ask Vijay to call me. Vijay or Ravi. Somebody to call me. No, this is the in inner part. Okay, now we can play. You see, I can hold it back. Can I have now? Uh, uh, now I like it better. We will switch now. I think that's an important trick. The needle keeps the graph down rather than migrate proximally. Yeah, but uh, I don't like it because it's a little bit bended. Okay, probably I will go more anteriorly. Okay, so uh, I was the anterior horn. Okay, can you hold this? Yes. Let me uh, give me one. Is this here? I will hold both uh, horns in place. Outside in suture. Can you hold this? Yes. Outside in. No. Uh, the, um, spinal needles. Two spinal needles. We can work here. One here, another one. Prepare the nylon. So now you'll put in some uh, outside in sutures in the yes, front exactly. part. Yes. Trying to. The set lag is killing me. Can I hold the camera? There we are. We go with the OK, there we go. I need a cluster. I will cut this uh, suture later, which is the, re the rest of the remnant of the previous all inside suture. OK, one here and the other one. Yes, take it out. We go for the second one. I will need the, did, did you, uh, number, those sutures that I cut? Do, okay. Okay, take the needle out. Good. You take it out. Hello. It's not coming? Okay. Ah, you got, okay, it's okay. Can you hold this? Do we have a number uh, two zero or is it, well, it's a, it's a two, okay. It's a kind of big, but no problem. No, I normally use what I left from the medical repair, but I think we just throw it away. Here. We retrieve them. Okay, this is working better. Excellent. Okay, can I hold it there? 
there's some remnant there that is probably preventing the graph from going down to its place. Uh -huh. I like it there. Let's see if I can take the this tutor. that? Ah, uh, but no, because I, I, I can't, uh, it's not lo long enough. Ah, okay, okay, yes. Ah. Ah, I have to switch port off. It's okay. I will take it later. Don't worry. Now I need, uh, can you hold this? A spinal needle again. And um, proof. There we go. Can you make a stab incision, another spinal needle? Stab incision for you, just right here, following the... Pablo, any particular reason you don't, don't like to use inside-out sutures? Uh, I normally don't use... Uh, I almost use the all-inside um, for the body. This, now we have this problem with the... Uh, with a little bit about, but normally I don't need. I, I repair all these aspects with uh, all inside. And the anterior aspect? Yes, one or two, like, like, we, like what we did before. Okay. We already done it. You know what? Um, give me the uh, all inside. Yes. Can you hold the camera? I think now we are in, in the right position. Uh, the camera is now. Can okay, hold it? But you have to pull from here, otherwise. This is at uh, 18 now. I hold it. I try to pull it downward. There we are. Okay, suture pusher. Wait, this is loose. Almost done. Slide. I don't know why. There we go. Okay. Now I'm much happier. That yeah. uh, okay. I will resect uh, now the this uh, meniscal suture here. Probably we can make. Can hold the. Uh,
Yeah. Okay. I will Perfect. Perfect. Probably I, we are all almost done. Probably yes. we can stop the lift surgery. I, I will fix both tunnels, all the sutures, and I will add another out in here, in your in your end, if you allow me to do so. Okay. So can you just uh, quickly put a probe in and just uh, you know demonstrate one more time with the scope in the anterolateral portal how the meniscus is looking right now, and then uh, we would then move on to the next session. Then once you're done with that. Okay, so this is the aspect. Okay, so you've got the posterior root fixed through a tunnel. You've put about three to four uh, all inside sutures. Yeah. You have. You will now put again a couple of outside in sutures. Yeah. And you will fix the roots. Any particular angle of flexion, where you will fix the roots. At what angle of flexion will you fix the posterior root and the anterior root? No, I mean at the end it's not important because it is the relationship is everything around the tibia. I don't do it in hyperflexion. I just between zero and ninety degrees. There is no much difference because at the end it's going only through the tibia. Okay. Uh, any questions? Uh, yes, Nagraj. Can you tie the two? Can you tie the two sutures together, or do you tie it over a button? Do you just tie? Yes, it? yes, both together. Both together. Yes. That's why I I want to have like a. One centimeter bridge between both tunnels. Okay, Nagraj. Just like in just like in primary meniscus repair, we give a lot of importance to the undersurface stitch for the restoration of the meniscotibial ligaments. Isn't it same important here also? Yes, he would probably be putting couple of sutures on the underside as well. Uh, once he's done with the top side sutures, so that uh, you have a good restoration of the whole meniscus. Pablo, what's your rehab program for this? How would you treat this patient post-op? I keep them uh, one month, no worry. Uh, and I allow uh, flexion from zero to 100 degrees in, in no way varying condition for six weeks. I, I, don't, I don't like to go farther than 90 or 100 degrees, but I'm kind of aggressive. I allow them to immediately uh, start range of motion movement up to 100 degrees. Because in fact, we are operating at 90 degrees, so I don't see any, any problem. But I keep them in uh, around uh, between four to six weeks in a non uh, way very condition. And if they want to run, when would you allow them to run? Would you allow them to run, and when would you allow <laughs> them to run? Yeah. Ideally, uh, never. Uh, because uh, meniscal transplantation is not for running and for impact activities, it's, for, it's a salvage procedure, uh, but at least six months. In any case, I really advise them not to do that. I really recommend not to do that, not to be involved in a strenuous activity, because this is something, this is not a new meniscus, this is something to keep the meniscus, uh, the, 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 the medial compartment a little bit healthier and painless. That's all the meniscal transplantation can do uh, so far. Thank you, you very take much. Follow-up MRIs, and have you had the good or bad fortune to uh, put a scope inside and see how the healing happens to the capsular ligaments on the periphery? Pardon me, if I do second second looks. Yes. Uh, second look arthroscopy. I, I, uh, I done some second looks because other conditions most. Of, to be honest, in most of the cases you do it for atrofibrosis, so in atrofibrosis the healing is perfect. But in any case, I did it, if I had to do it for, in those cases I did it for an unrelated reason. Um, uh, this, uh, the, the healing, that's, a, that's why I'm not very aggressive with the uh, implants here, because the healing uh, to the capsule is very good. It's much better than when we face meniscal repairs. So this is Can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? Yes, Roshan. Yeah. Uh, Pablo, uh, there has been uh, many reports about this meniscus transplant and almost more than 20 years that people started doing meniscus transplant. What eventually happens to this meniscus? Does it form a meniscus type tissue or it forms just a type 2 collagen which is good enough to be uh, as a scaffold? What do you mean, with the meniscal transplant? Yeah, with, with the meniscus transplant. It's almost more than 20 years people started doing meniscus transplant in the uh, Western world as well as in Korea and Japan. Yeah, more than that, even 30 and 40 degrees, uh, 40 years already. Okay. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, no, I, I believe that it doesn't work as, as an scaffold. It okay. Uh, you can have some degrees of repopulation. There are some studies some with host, cell, host cells. It has been published, but I don't... I don't believe that never did this really working as a native uh, uh, tissue. This is always working mostly uh, as uh, well as a, an uh, external device 
which biomechanically represents more closely the meniscus than any other uh, artificial device. But I don't believe that this, at some point, uh, it's really healed and incorporated as a native tissue. Okay, thank you. But Rohan, uh, uh, but Roshan, to answer you, there have been studies that have done biopsies on these grafts, yeah. which have shown repopulation yeah, yeah. of the allograft with the, uh, with the recipient's cells. So definitely there is, like we have collagenization for yeah. our ACLs, ACL, we have way. a biological process also that's taking Absolutely. place. Absolutely, I, I agree with those, uh, that observation, I just commented on that. But it's still, from my, but, uh, I mean, but biomechanically, it, it, it might so, not be that strong. Speak yeah. to the to the microscopy, uh, to, to the microscopic assessment, because uh, from a biomechanical and real meniscal point of view, it never behaves. No, as, but uh, vascularization cannot happen there because it's a vascular tissue. Exactly, the so tissue is completely avascular. That is the reason why we do allograft transplant. Otherwise, live tissue allograft, there will be a lot of rejection. Absolutely, we are very happy tissue. when we, we see the Mason trichromic, uh, you know, <laughs> just uh, tying the, the meniscus in the samples. But uh, I don't believe that it, it will never help. It will not work at a, a, new, a real one. Okay. One question: How much is the cost, and uh, does the insurance cover that there in your country and as well as in India, Dr. Dinsho? So I think it's about 6,000 US dollars uh, is the cost of the meniscus. It's never, it's never and there's a customs duty which is over a lakh and a half as well. So it is uh, for all Kerala surgeons. <laughs> ah, the land, the rich land. Okay, thank you, Pablo. Thank you so much for You're demonstrating welcome. the first ever live uh, meniscus transplant. A big round of applause. And we'll let you finish your uh, surgery. Thank you so very much. So thank you, Dinsha. Thank you, Sujit. And uh, we'll move on to the next session. And uh, we'll have uh, Dinsha give his keynote. And he'll be speaking on hidden lesions of the meniscus, roots, ramps, and much more. I don't know what more there is now, Dinsha. What else are you hiding from us? Not too much more, fortunately. So I'm going to talk on hidden lesions of the meniscus. The posterior aspect of the medial meniscus is largely hidden. And if you don't suspect a tear then, you don't specifically look for it, you might miss it. And that's why these lesions are called hidden lesions. So take this patient, for example. You've actually had to go into the notch, take off some of the fat there around the PCL, and then when you probe it, you'll realize that there's a medial meniscus root tear. If you were just to look at it cursorily, you may miss this tear. And therefore, this is called a hidden lesion. So once you probe it and you specifically look at it, then you'll find it. Similarly, when you look at this particular aspect, the posterior aspect of the medial meniscus, and you just put your probe there and try and feel for a tear, you might feel your probe disappearing there. And that gives you some sort of indication that there may be a tear there. And then you need to go into the notch, turn your scope around, and then use your probe as a retraction device and then when you do that, you'll find that there's a ramp tear. So a ramp tear is a peripheral meniscocapsular junction tear of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. So these two lesions, roots and ramps, are called hidden lesions of the meniscus. Now, why are they important? So the medial meniscus root, as we know, is the attachment into the bone. And when you get a root tear like this, there's going to be extrusion. And when there's extrusion, the meniscus comes out. When the meniscus comes out, you're going to have higher peak pressures. And in three years, you can see that this patient's gone from this state to a medial compartment osteoarthritic state. We know from multiple biomechanical studies that if you've got peak pressures which are intact in this sort of patient with a root avulsion, there's going to be peak pressures which are much higher and because of that, this knee is going to progress into osteoarthritis. If you do an anatomic repair, you can restore these peak pressures. But if you do a non-anatomic repair, then you will not be able to restore this. And this patient would be doomed towards degenerative changes. So let's try and understand with a case example what the clinical and surgical scenario would be. So this is a typical sort of patient for a medial meniscus root tear. So this is a 50-year-old female. She's presented with a three-month history of inability to bear weight in her left knee associated with pain and limp. So when these patients are lying down or sitting, they say they're perfectly all right. But as soon as they start walking, they get pain in the medial compartment. They sometimes will tell you that they felt a snap with a minimal activity, like getting up from a stool or while descending stairs. 
And these usually will progress over time. So these are symptoms that will progress over time despite physiotherapy. Now, when you get an MRI done, you'll note, when you get, look at the X-ray, the X-ray will often show you a little bit of decrease in their joint space, which may not necessarily be associated with degenerative changes. And then, when you look at the MRI, you'll note that there's a separation of the root from its attachment, and as soon as you come to the mid-coronal cuts, you'll see a extr an extrusion of the meniscus. Now, this is classical with a root tear. Looking at the SAG image, you'll see what's known as a ghost sign. So you'll see a gray-colored meniscus, and this is called the ghost sign. And in a well-cut actual image, you'll actually see the root being detached. So typically for this patient, what would I do? If the patient doesn't have significant osteoarthritic changes, that means the patient has just a kelgren lorentz grade 1 or 2, I think it's worthwhile to do a repair. If it's 3 or 4, I think your repair is not going to help. I typically go down, freshen the bone, at the root area, also freshen the undersurface of the meniscus. Then you put your jig in there, and now you can get these special aimers, both for the medial and the lateral. So these are curved, so they are left and right. And once you've aimed for your uh, anatomic footprint, you put your drill in there. This tends to be posterior and medial, and you have to have it anatomic, as these studies have shown. If it's non-anatomic, you, you, you probably will not get the correct forces. You then need to pass a suture through, and you can pass this with any of the instruments available. You could use a suture passer, you could use one of these instruments, and then pass either a suture or a tape. My preference nowadays is tape, because it tends to be um, uh, low profile, at the same time it's going to give you better compression forces. It also holds on to the meniscus. Now there are different suture configurations. I like to use a cinch configuration so that this doesn't cut through this degenerate meniscal tissue. And I often will take two sutures five millimeters apart so that I can get a footprint restoration of the root. Thereafter, the tapes need to be passed down through that tunnel. And once they're passed through that tunnel, you tighten them make sure you've got an anatomical reduction of the roots, and then tie it over a small button on the anterior part of the shin. Now, you always need to make sure, once you've done this, that you've got a reduction of your extrusion. And although I may say that this looks good on arthroscopy, typically I'll find, if you were to evaluate these patients with MRI, this is one aspect that we haven't really been able to address so well. In weight-bearing, the meniscus does extrude despite a good root repair. So that's what the post-op x-ray would look like. Now we know that there are many different types of root tears, and I think it's important to recognize these because the repair techniques are different for these. Now the first type, and this is the classification by Laprade, this is an incomplete root tear. And sometimes you'll find this when you're doing a ligament reconstructive surgery. An incomplete root tear, this would not have retracted because you've got some attachment there. The white shiny fibers are still intact. You'll find that it hasn't retracted. But I still think if you're there, it's worthwhile to put a suture and repair it. Now, type 2 is the most common type. And what we just saw, that was a type 2A. Now, in this type 2A, the tear is immediately close to the root. But you could get tears which are 3, 6, or 9 millimeters away from the root too. Like this, this is a type 2B or a C tear. Now, when you do this, your tunnel cannot be anatomic. It needs to be a little more medial so that you don't overtension the root. And at the same time, I think it's worthwhile to tie some sutures at the stump. So this stump which is remaining, you can tie some end-to-end -end sutures and thereby get an anatomic repair. The type threes are tears such as this. So you'll see the root, it's not detached from the bone, but this has a longitudinal tear directly there in the root, well seen here in this uh, image too. And when you go down, you'll note that that's what the tear looks like. So you've got a longitudinal tear in the middle of the meniscus towards zone 1 to 2, and that goes directly into the root. And this is not something that you do want to do a partial meniscectomy on, because you'll lose too much of your meniscus. So you'd go ahead with a repair. This is a simple longitudinal type repair, end to end. And when you've done that, you've got your multiple sutures. So you can see, I haven't put any suture down transosseous in the root, because both those attachments in the root are intact. You've got type 4s, and these are, I think, extremely common. And these are the ones where there's an oblique tear here, 
and these are also the ones where if you don't identify and repair them, they will retract uh, quite significantly and quite quickly. So you need to put in a hybrid sort of suture there. So one pull out with a cinch, and then you can use an all inside and again get an end-to-end -end restoration. And that end-to-end -end restoration in this part, because you freshen the bone, you'll get a good blood clot there. This is going to heal. And finally, the type 5s, which are the bony root avulsions. These are relatively simple. It just comes off with a piece of bone. You need to identify it because, again, this is a hidden lesion. Unless you probe it and you're looking for it, you won't see it. And one of the key factors here is the bone edema. So if you see on the MRI that there's a lot of bone edema here with a root tear, look out for a small bony avulsion. And then, of course, you go ahead and repair it the way uh, that we did with two cinch knots, a good footprint sort of repair that gets this uh, rigidly into the uh, bone area that you've freshened. Now, lateral menisci also have root tears, but these don't tend to be the older degenerate patients. These tend to be younger patients with ACL tears. So normally when you see a lateral meniscus root tear, you will often have it with an ACL tear. And if you have a lateral meniscus root tear, these patients will have quite a significant pivot shift. If you miss this lateral meniscus root tear, this patient will persistently have a rotational instability and his ACL may fail. So it's important to identify lateral meniscus root tears with ACL tears and go ahead and repair them. And it's best to take a separate tunnel for this, though the tunnels for the ACL and the lateral uh, posterior uh, root of the lateral meniscus are quite close. And finally, you may find some complex sorts of lateral meniscus root tears where, again, you'll need a hybrid sort of technique. So I think you need to have everything in your armamentarium, and you need to be open-minded in the sense that you could be variable in the type of repair that you do with these roots. So again, here, I've taken one cinch knot into a tunnel, reduced my extrusion of the meniscus, and then I'm going to take an end-to-end -end suture between the two stumps to ensure that I've got good anatomical congruity, which is not under excessive tension. So you have to be uh, comfortable with different techniques of meniscus repair when you're taking care of these meniscus root lesions. So, so these were all of the different sorts of root tears. A very pertinent question was asked uh, uh, by Roshan before. What if the patient has a medial compartment or a malalignment. So he might have a grade one or a grade two uh, OA. The patient's young, has a malalignment. This is not a patient you want to do a unique compartmental knee replacement on. You could do a root repair with a high tibial osteotomy. So any malalignment in varus that is significant, I think is worthwhile that you go ahead and do a root repair and at the same time consider an osteotomy. Because if you don't offload that medial compartment, then this is likely to fail. A few years back, we assessed our outcomes with 50 patients of uh, transosseous root uh, repairs. And these were retrospectively analyzed. We had 41 with, which were medial meniscus and 9 which were lateral meniscus. And the interesting finding that we had was, although all clinical parameters initially showed good improvement, about 22%, that means almost a quarter of these patients still had some residual medial compartment pain. And I think that's primarily because of the degenerative joint disease. This is a degenerative problem, and you're not going to get away with that with a mechanical uh, sort of fixation. But at least you do get 75% that do have a lasting uh, uh, improvement of their pain. We saw 12 patients who had radiographic increase in their OA by one or two grades. And you can see in this patient, at four years too, we don't have any significant changes. But compare this to if we had not done it, and we had quite a few patients who didn't undergo root repairs. So take this patient, for instance. This patient, when this patient came to us, this is what it was, a root tear, some amount of virus, didn't want treatment, underwent non-operative treatment, and you can see in three years, this patient has gone into a significant medial compartment OA with a spontaneous osteonecrosis of the medial femoral condyle, a spunk. So if you don't operate on them, many of them will have significant degenerative changes. Quickly now, the ramps. So these ramp tears are peripheral menisco-capsular junction tears of the medial meniscus, and in these, the menisco-tibial ligament gets disrupted. Now, this is quite a controversial entity still, but I certainly feel that if you've got a ramped lesion, your ramp is your secondary restraint to anterior tibial translation. So if your ACL has a significant ramp and you just go ahead and do an ACL reconstruction and leave the ramp alone, you're likely to have 
failure over time because your secondary restraint is failing. And in these, you've got the partial, you've got the complete, and you've got the complex ramps. Now, in the partial, you've got the superior and the inferior. So for the superior, you need to see this with a notch view. So you look from the notch, and you'll note that this is a partial ramp on the superior aspect. Now, this really doesn't require treatment. This just requires a little bit of rasping. You put an ACL in there, this is going to stabilize because the inferior part, the meniscotibial ligament is intact, this is going to heal. Unlike that, a partial ramp which is inferior by definition is unstable because your meniscotibial ligament is torn. And in fact, in these patients, you can't see it from the notch side, you'll be able to see it from the joint side. And when you put your probe in, you'll see that you can actually displace the meniscus. So this unstable meniscus there, despite it being partial, needs to be repaired. When you look at it, traditionally, you'd look at the notch and you'll say, oh, there's no ramp out there. But if you were to look at it from within the joint and you note that the inferior part is torn, then I think that you must go ahead and repair it. And a simple all-inside undersurface tear repair is all that's required. Typically, two or three sutures there on the undersurface would be OK. If this extends further, then you may want to put in a, a suture that goes through and through. So you can see what I've done is one suture which is in the undersurface, one suture that's gone across, and this would stabilize your meniscus during your ACL reconstruction. A complete ramp tear, a complete ramp tear needs to be treated like any longitudinal uh, meniscus uh, uh, tear. Now you could do this from the posteromedial compartment at 90 degrees, but if you were to do this at 30 degrees, then you'll find that your posterior capsule really sits down. So all you need to do is freshen it and use an all-inside technique of, uh, uh, with your devices that you have. Put in one suture above and one suture below so that you can repair your meniscocapsular ligament and your meniscotibial ligament. So the first one goes above and repairs the meniscocapsular ligament. The second one comes below and repairs the meniscotibial ligament. And so this is a classical simple ramp repair. Finally, the complex ramps. So complex ramps have, besides the longitudinal tear, they'll have an additional bucket handle tear or a horizontal tear. What you need to do again in these is repair it. So you convert your complex into a simple ramp and then go ahead and use an all inside suture device to uh, repair it. So finally, partial ramps, no repair, but if it's an inferior complete or a complex ramp, then I think you must repair it. And finally, one entity that's on the lateral meniscus. So this is called a lateral meniscus Risberg rip tear. So this is a similar hidden lesion of the lateral meniscus. This is like a ramp tear of the lateral meniscus. And what happens here is a separation between the lateral meniscus and the Risberg ligament. So this is what it looks like, classical ramp lesion on the lateral side. And this again is repaired with a very similar all inside technique where you suture it above to the meniscocapsular and below to the meniscotibial after freshening it. Thank you very much.